Okay, so welcome everyone to the ICT String Seminar, which today is joined with the MatFIS Seminar Series of ICTS. And so today we are very happy to have uh, Yuji Tachikawa from IPMU, who will tell us about undecided problems in quantum field theory. So Yuji, over to you. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, it's a very, it's very nice that I can talk about uh, this subject uh, today in front of all of you. Um, so this paper appeared on uh, April 1st, and uh, the topic is not exactly uh, as you would usually expect to appear on HEPTH. Uh, so uh, the content of my talk today is also kind of more for the entertainment. <laughs> so let's, let's see how it goes. Um, I, I just want to point out the somewhat uh, different aspects inherent in uh, what we theoretical physicists often do. So that's the content of my talk. And the title is Undecidable Problems in Quantum Field Theory. And for those of you who want to have the slides, uh, let me just send you the link of the PDF file to you. So in case the video quality goes down, you can open the PDF file and see it yourself. Okay, let me start. Uh, so uh, as everybody knows, life is unpredictable, right? And uh, theoretical physics is no exception. So there are many inherent uh, unpredictability in physics. Uh, maybe the most famous one, is the inherent probabilistic nature in quantum mechanics, which you learn in quantum mechanical course. And uh, then you learn that some other kind of uh, non-predictability is also present in deterministic classical systems. So those are called chaotic behaviors. So what happens is that the small slight change in the initial condition gets amplified exponentially. So you lose uh, predictability in a short period of time. So that's the chaotic behavior. But uh, the unpredictability I'd like to talk about today uh, is something different. It's, so it's a third type of unpredictability. So let's see how it's like. Uh, so and please ask me any questions uh, during the talk. I mean, it's not really a... Uh, uh, it's a serious talk in some sense. Uh, I just, I'm just going to uh, emphasize an aspects of physics, which is not usually emphasized. So please do ask me questions. So, uh, so let's idealize what we theoretical physicists do. So theoretical physicists working on a topic X often spend their entire lives on answering the following question. So let's say take a particular system small x in this topic capital X, and you ask whether it has the property P of your choice. So uh, people who like gauge theories uh, want to consider various four dimensional gauge theories, right? And then you want to ask whether the particular gauge theory X confines in the infinite limit. Many people work on this subject. As another example, uh, you can consider many types of one-dimensional quantum spin chains. It's very popular in condensed matter physics, right? And you might want to ask whether a particular such model X is gapless in the continuum limit, uh, or in a terminology more palatable to uh, high energy physicists, uh, whether X becomes CFT in the continuum limit. So that's another type of questions. Um, some of us, like supersymmetric series very much. In that case, um, you might want to know whether a particular given such system spontaneously breaks supersymmetry, right? So that's another type of questions. Finally, uh, you can be a condensed matter experimentalist. In that case, your subject capital X consists of various materials, and then the property you want to look for, for example, can be whether a particular system, small x, is superconducting at room temperature and normal pressure, right? 
So if you find uh, such a superconducting material, then that's revolutionary, right? So that's many people, that's a subject many people work on. So, well, this is one way to try to idealize what theoretical physicists do. O of course, I mean, string theorists might not work in this way, right? Uh, and I, I don't always fit into this framework, but this is one way to uh, formalize it. For example, uh, last year, I spent uh, almost 50% of my research time to answer whether a particular one dimensional spin chain is a CFT in the infinite limit. So, well, the particular example is not uh, important for today's purpose, but I just want to illustrate what kind of activity physicists do, uh, because this is supposed to be joint uh, mass physics uh, seminar, right? It's not just string seminar, but joint mass physics seminar. So what, what I was doing last year was to look for, uh, study a certain spin chain. So in that spin chain, uh, you consider a number of sites uh, arranged one dimensionally. And at each site, you consider six dimensional uh, Hilbert space with labeled by these levels. And uh, so the total Hilbert space is the tensor product of these six dimensional Hilbert spaces. And you impose some nearest neighbor constraints. And the Hamiltonian is a sum of three body interactions, uh, which acts on the basis states in this way. And uh, so you, you start from a certain set of constants, F, A, B, C, D, and you consider a particular combination acting this way, and you sum over them, over the whole position of the lattice. Um, so this model, for example, can be motivated in various ways using uh, fusing categories, etc. cetera. Uh, that's not really important for the, today's topic, but uh, I just wanted to say that some people in our community want to understand uh, what is the property of the ground state of such spin chain. Sorry, what are the A's? Here, A's? Yeah, uh, A's okay. are the labels. Yeah, so, so in, in the A's, you, you have six choices, one alpha, alpha squared, rho, alpha, rho, alpha, squared row. So th these are the labels. Well, you can just equally label them as from one to six. And then there's a tensor with uh, four index, four indices, each, and each index goes from one to six. And this is some particular type of local interaction, right? So, so this model is uh, of interest to some people and no exact solution is known. So we needed to resort to numerical simulations on computer clusters for months, right? And we had a numerical result saying that it becomes a CFT, two-dimensional CFT in the infrared uh, in the long distance limit of central charge of, of about two or 2.1. So uh, those who are not interested would, might say, why would you study it? But uh, well, there are some interest in this model. And I wrote a paper with these nice collaborators. And on the same day, uh, an European group wrote a paper on exactly the same topic. So we coordinated the publication and there's also a follow-up paper uh, in March. So, I mean, it's just, I just wanted to say that people are interested in studying the ground state properties of such spin chains, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be this particular Hamiltonian, but uh, you can ask questions like, given such a Hamiltonian, what is the property of the ground state? Does it become a CFD or does it have a, be, become a massive QFD or in a gapped state? So you naturally wonder, I naturally wondered why do we have to work this hard, right? It's 2022. Um, so I would have expected that condensed metaphysics has advanced to a stage where you can just type in the Hamiltonian to some database or whatever, and immediately uh, the ground state property is known. So 
we are not at this stage yet, right? But uh, I thought that eventually, once human technology or human intelligence as the human beings as a whole uh, develops enough, then I thought that there will be a deterministic way, algorithmic way to, uh, to determine whether a given spin chain Hamiltonian has a gapless ground state or it becomes a conformal field state in the infrared. But it's such a simple question, right? And so and maybe in this year, we haven't still been at this stage as a community as a whole. But I originally thought that in the far future, uh, there should be an algorithm uh, which allows us to determine such questions. But then I learned a shocking fact exactly around a year ago. So it can happen that for certain choices of the set of questions and the property, uh, there is no uniform algorithm deciding whether a chosen X has the property P for an arbitrarily chosen X. Furthermore, even more strangely, there can be a strange particular model such that whether the particular model X0 has the property P is uh, undecidable, unprovable. So such, let's call such pair of questions, uh, the set of models X and the property P is undecidable, right? So what are the examples? Well, the existence of such undecidable questions in physics was first explicitly pointed out to my knowledge in this paper from 2015. There, the undecidability of the following question was shown. So the class of, quest, class of systems consists of two dimensional nearest neighbor quantum spin systems. And the property they considered was whether X becomes gapless in the continuum limit, whether it becomes conformal field theory in the limit. So, but that's undecidable. And then this result was further strengthened to 1D spin change in a paper a few years later. So there cannot be any such algorithm solving the question for us. So that's the fact. In this talk, so I'd like to give a brief review of how such an undecidability comes about. And I will also show that the following quantum field theory question is undecidable. So the class of systems you consider uh, are a two dimensional, a two comma two supersymmetric quantum field theory. And uh, the property you would like to ask is whether a particular chosen X has supersymmetric vacua. So somewhat surprisingly, this question cannot be answered in an algorithmic way. So that's what I'm going to uh, discuss today. And so all we need to You're saying that if you put more information, then you can decide? But um, what, typically, typically, no. <laughs> I assume sometimes we know the case where it has supersymmetry, then what makes it to us to decide that it has that property? Well, so. Is it when I, when, I, when I say it's undecidable, I'm not saying that you can you cannot answer that for any particular case. I mean, of course, there are cases where we can determine whether it has supersymmetric vacuum or not. I'm just saying that there is no uniform algorithm which automatically determines whether a system ha has or does not have supersymmetric vacuum. So I, I, I'm coming. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. going to explain that in the <laughs> latter part of my oh. talk, because without the preparation, it's kind of hard to get exactly what is going on. So please a bit, be patient, thank you. <laughs> so, so all we need to uh, ex uh, explain this is just some basic materials from theoretical computer science, Gerdold's incompleteness theorems, and theory of Diophantan equations. Uh, what we need to use are all extremely fundamental and basic results of each of the subjects discovered a long time ago, at least half a century and often even more. So, uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is extremely basic 
to the experts on these subjects. <laughs> but it's just that the topic are uh, a bit exotic for standard uh, string theorists and mathematical physicists, I think. So my main aim is just to give a very rough overview of the standard materials and how they're realized in the specific cases of spin chains and uh, the supersymmetric model, right? And I am not an expert myself. Uh, yes, go ahead. So when you are saying that uh, it's, uh, you'll prove that it's undecidable whether this particular system has so much supersymmetric vacua, but uh, when you, when it's obvious that you indeed have supersymmetric vacua, doesn't the question become moot? <laughs> yeah, Let, let's please ask that after I finish the talk because <laughs> undecidability needs a bit of getting used to. So yeah, let, let, let's please, 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 please wait for that. Okay. So I'm not an expert myself, uh, but I can be an expert in this uh, logic or computer science stuff in the audience. So in that case, please do co correct me if I say something wrong. So that's, that's the introduction. So let me, let me start with the basics, one basic feature of computing. It's called halting problem. One fundamental result in theoretical computer science is this. There is no algorithm which tells whether a pro program holds in finite time or not. So there is no algorithm which tells whether a given program stops in finite time or not. Let us recall why this is the case, or let me tell you why this is the case. But to make it rigorous, we need to define what an algorithm is, right? But for us, a rough discussion suffices. So for us, an algorithm is a finite length program written in a text file, which is executed by a CPU deterministically, depending on an input. And we assume that the input is also given in a text file, right? So I assume that all of you uh, received the basic uh, computer science course in your first year in college. So you are forced to learn how to program in Python or Java or Fortran, depending on your age. And the program almost always runs into infinite loop and it doesn't stop, right? And it doesn't compile to start with, for example. So, so there's a bug, right? And you need to debug it. It takes a lot of time. It's messy. So we all wish a program which solves this halting problem, which checks whether a given program uh, runs into an infinite loop or not, right? So if su such a program exists, then you don't have to manually look for an infinite loop, right? So you, you just have to run that program against the program you wrote then that would tell you whether it contains an infinite loop bug or not. But this is impossible. To see this, assume otherwise, right? Then there is a program H, which tells whether a given program P with a given input text file T holds in finite time, right? Suppose there is a, exists such a program H. We now write the following program C, which accepts an input text file T, right? So the program does the following. So this program reads the content of the text file T as a program T, right? Of course, a random, random text file cannot be thought of as a program. So in that case, you just discard it. But then if the content of the text file T makes sense as a program, then we use this miraculous program H to see whether the program T holds in finite time if you give the original text file T as an input, right? And if, it, if the, this miraculous program says P holds, then this program itself goes into an infinite loop. On the other hand, if the miraculous program says that it does not hold, then we stop this program, right? So that's the program we write. This program is a really strange program. First of all, usually uh, we are, I mean, we are feeding the text file T into the program T, right? Uh, you, the program you usually write does not accept, accept it, expect this, right? I mean, usually your program is not prepared to be given a program text itself, but we do this anyway to stress test the program to see whether there's a bug or not, right? So we now write this program into a text file C and let's consider how 
this program C behaves when the same program is given as the text file input, right? So what goes on is this. So C, with C as the input, that's the following. Regard the content of the C text file as the program C. So that's the program itself. And use the miraculous program H to see if this program C holds in finite time, given C as the input, right? And if H says it holds, this program goes into an infinite loop. And if H says it does not hold, then it, it stops its execution. So we see that C with C as input holds if it doesn't, and it doesn't hold and it goes into an infinite loop if it does. So it's a contradiction. Um, you might get confused, but in that case, please download the slides and carefully think about it for 10 minutes or so. And that's exactly what it does. So it's, it's a contradiction. This means that our assumption that there's such a miraculous program exists was wrong. But there cannot be any program H which determines this holding problem. Um, I, I have a question about this. Just uh, uh, yeah. why is it important to give input C to C itself uh, to the newly construct this construction? I mean, I could have given any other input or the input of the original program itself. This yeah, program. but if if you do that, you don't get into a contradiction. <laughs> Um, yeah, okay. yeah, so it's important you can, you can. for the IC. Okay. Yeah. So if you do, if you feed a different input, then this analysis just relates whether a certain program given a certain different input holds or not is related to a different program given a different input holds or not, right? But this is constructed in a contrived way so that C given C holds a knot is related in the opposite way, right? <laughs> to, to, okay. to C with C holds a knot. So that's that's how it goes. Uh, I'll let yeah, so that's the holding problem. And I'm going to, I, I already finished my lightning review of computer science we need <laughs> and going to mathematical logic. So it's Gadel's incompleteness theorems. I just, want to, just wanted to ask this. When compared, yes, uh, theoretical computer science people classify programs based on polynomial times and non-polynomial times. Where does this halting time, uh, uh, like, uh, since you proved that there is no program which can determine this halting time, uh, uh, right. uh, where does this exactly fit into the picture? Like when you, uh, when these people say that uh, some programs can be completed, some algorithms can be can take polynomial time and non-polynomial time. Saying that I mean, halting time. So this program doesn't exist. So <laughs> it doesn't mean anything to, I mean, you cannot classify them into P or NP. I mean, it just doesn't exist. Yeah. I see. I see. Yeah. Uh, so sorry, so can, can I ask a question? Yes, um, please. Uh, sorry, I, this, is, this is a little bit vague, but um, you essentially got a contradiction by uh, doing, by making the program call itself, right? So some sort of a self. That's, that's, that's self right, that's something. right. So can you, yeah. Can, is there a statement of the kind that uh, there does exist an algorithm for uh, to which decides whether uh, programs halt or not, as long as you you prohibit self recursion? You know. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Way. Of course, of course, there can be programs which can determine a subclass of all possible programs, uh, whether a su subclass of all programs can uh, halt, halt or not. Yeah. For example, that sub that sub particular subclass can be as small as just a trivial program of which does nothing, right? Right, right. Then, then that automatically <laughs> stops in finite time. So there's a mm -hmm. classification of all possible programs, right? I'm just saying that there is no single universal algorithm which can determine all the entire possibility of all programs we can write. Right, right. But presumably of course, the class there... is also uh, is not, is not too small, right? In the sense that presumably, uh, I don't know enough about the subject, but presumably the, 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 there exists a large class of algorithms for a uh, large class of uh, yeah, yeah, algorithms yeah. for right, right. decide whether it falls or not. Right, time. right. So, so, so if you are fond of programming, then indeed there's a automatic tools which can detect many possible bugs, but it doesn't determine all possible bugs. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. So, so let just, me give a yes, just a please. Small, a small question. So, um, does this also um, does is there a similar statement for like quantum computing, or do you restrict to classical computing? Yeah. Um, classical computing. Uh, Quantum computing includes classical computing. I mean, cl any classical computing can be uh, simulated in a quantum pro right? So, I see, okay, I see, okay. So, yeah, so I, I think the similar statement holds. I see, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So, uh, everyone's happy? <laughs> so let me go to Geldo's second incompleteness theorem, which says whether the standard set theory is consistent or not, cannot be proved within the standard set theory. So to get some sense of what this means, we need some practice, we need some preparations, right? So a model of a given set of axioms is a mathematical structure satisfying the said set of axioms, right? For example, let curly G be the set of axioms of a group, right? So a model of G is a group. So it's something very familiar to all of us. We often write down definitions of a group and we study groups. We write down definitions of rings and we study rings, right? It's just a formal uh, formalization of this uh, activity. And whether a particular statement is true or false depends on the model, right? For example, AB equals BA for all A and B is true for abelian groups, but not for non-abelian groups. Again, it's obvious, right? So, but from this, we learned the following very important facts. Whether a statement P can be proved from the set of axioms uh, depends on the model. So if a statement P can be proved from the axioms, then P is true in all models, right? If, if just by logical deductions, you can prove a statement, from the axioms, then in any mathematical structure satisfying the set of axioms, satisfy the derived property. So that's this, what I'm saying here. But instead, if a statement cannot be proved from the set, set of axioms, then the validity of that statement depends on the chosen model. So in this case, the statement AB equals BA for all A and B, cannot be proved from the axioms of the group, right? Because there can be both non-abelian groups and also abelian groups. So there are some models of the axioms of groups uh, where, such that this is true. And there are some other models for which this axiom is not true. So there should be no problem in accepting that the questions, whether a statement can be proved or not from a given set of axioms and whether a statement is true or false, in a given model of a set of axioms are a priori different, right? So there can be unprovable statements in a given set of axioms. And in that case, its validity can depend on the model considered. It is just that question. it's, yes, please. So when you're defining non-abelian groups, isn't it axiomatic that you say that AB unequal to BA I mean, isn't it a part of the axioms that you define to define the non-abelian groups? Yes. Uh, so I'm just saying that in the standard uh, set of axioms for the group, this statement AB is equal equals to BA for all A and B, or there's some a pair of A and B which doesn't satisfy this, are not in the axioms, right? So. So in the axiom of non-abelian groups, we included this. In the, so sorry, we, we include the negation of this. For the axiom of abelian groups, we include this statement. But this means that this statement that AB commutes for all A and B cannot be derived from the other axioms of groups. So that's what I want to emphasize. From the other axioms, okay. Yeah, for, from the other axioms. But I mean, uh, you have to have a certain set of axioms, right? I mean, that's right. And uh, what if you include this particular axiom in that set? Then it it only describes abelian groups. Yeah. 
No, I mean, you can always define the axiom as whether AB equals BA is then it's abelian and AB unequal to BA is non-abelian. You can define the axiom that way, right? Right, right. I mean, so you can add this sentence to the set of axioms. Then that ax set of axioms describe only abelian groups. I, I, I'm just saying that. Yeah, it's kind of tautological in this case, right? Maybe it was not a good uh, example. Yeah. But what, what Gedo found is that this state of affairs is applicable to the standard set theory itself. Therefore, this state of affairs is applicable to the entire mathematics. So it's a bit weird, but that's life. So this means that there are mathematical statements whose truth value depends on the model of the set theory or the model of mathematics, the entire mathematics. And Gödel's second incompleteness theorem says that the consistency of the set theory itself is one such statement. What does it mean, right? So a set of axioms is called consistent if you cannot prove a contradiction such as zero equals one from that, right? So, so that's the definition. And then I need to define what the proof is. So a proof of a theorem is a series of logical detections starting from a set of accents, given set of accents, right? And finding a proof requires ingenuity. In contrast, checking whether a proof is valid can be done mechanically in principle, right? Because you just have to start from axioms and all you need is just a very basic logical detections and it eventually leads to a non-trivial statement. And this is actually a thriving field of study known as automatic proof verifiers. For example, the proof of Gödel's second incompletion theorem itself has been verified by, by uh, such means. And you, if you are interested, you can read these papers. And let me discuss another complicated proof which has been successfully verified because it's a fun story. Um, so, you know this way of- I can ask uh, a question. Yes, please. Uh, there is no, but there is no guarantee that such a proofreader will give a, a conclusive answer, right? It's kind of like the halting problem, right? Yeah, would, um, should, like, yeah, given a proofreader the program, is, like, is it clear that it will always give an answer or something? Well, so that depends on how you define a proof verifier. So here I'm using the word proof verifier in a restricted sense. So this proof verifier does not try to look for a proof, right? It just checks with a uh, proof, purported proof written by a uh, human being is actually true, right? But in that case, it's just doing the job of a referee, but more thoroughly, right? So, you, so in a mathematical paper, well, physics paper is very, I mean, very non-rigorous. So there's no way to have 100% uh, credibility in it. But the math paper, in principle, each statement, can be derived from a statement one step before, right? You just use already derived lemmas in a ordinary mathematical logical uh, derivations. So each step sh should be valid. And what a proof verifier does is just to check the, these steps starting from the set, given set of axioms and nothing else. So it, it is not, uh, intelligent enough to look for a proof. Of course, Google or Microsoft can come up with a nice AI based on deep learning, trying to <laughs> come up with a proof, but that's not what I'm talking about here. Yeah. It's just that checking the proof given by humans. Okay. So another big pr uh, proof which was verified, mechanically is this statement. So in three-dimensional space, you try to pack spheres of constant radius as densely as possible. And uh, we expect that this is the densest packing, but that is not proven until very recently. That's known as Kepler's conjecture. And mathematician Thomas Hales announced the proof in 1998. 
and it took I seven have... years. Uh, yes, I go have... ahead. Yeah, so in the uh, in the proof of the Gödel's incompleteness theorem yes. by by computers, doesn't yes. the proof itself uh, suffer from the Gödel's incompleteness theorem because you are applying a certain set of rules in order to in in incorporate the theorem, right? So not really. Why is um, that? Well, the computer is just doing the referee's job of reading each line of the proof. That's a very mechanical process, which, yeah. uses, which, which yeah. uses a very small part of the entire uh, axiom of math. No, yeah. I mean, a referee always uses a certain set of axioms, right? Yes. So, uh, so the, 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 the same set of axioms which suffer from the Gödel's incompleteness theorem would be applicable here also, right? Yes. I mean, in, in case of the computer also. Yes. So, I mean, so how 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 is that proving the Gödel's incompleteness theorem? Because well, well, I mean, Gödel's incompleteness theorem does not say that Gödel's incompleteness theorem is not provable. What Gödel's incompleteness theorem says is that there is a statement which is not provable. So it is still true that Gödel's theorem is provable. That's what I'm but, saying. How is it in in order to make the statement that it is provable, you have to assume a set of certain set of axioms, which don't suffer from the Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Right? No, 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 no. I mean, every axiom suffers from Gödel's incompleteness theorems. Exactly. So yeah. if if the if the set of ax if the if the proof suffers from the same problem that Gödel pointed out. How is that a proof? Um, okay, so let's take the point of view of yours. Then every proof appearing in every mathematical journal is meaningless, right? <laughs> because the standard set theory. Well, I mean, uh, that's, that's the whole point of the Gödel's theorem, right? No. <laughs> No, Gödel's theorem just says that there are some particular theorems which cannot be proved. It, it does not say that every proof, every theorem is not pr provable. That's disaster, right? It just says that there's a very funny, peculiar statement which cannot be proved. No, but in, but, order, to, in order to prove the Gödel's incompleteness theorem, you have to first <laughs> prove that the set of axioms that you're assuming are no. not within that set, right? Which are, which don't obey the Gödel's incompleteness theorem. No, right? no, no, no. So why isn't that? Uh, so, so, so that time maybe we can leave this discussion for the end. So yeah. Let, let you finish. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, so what happened is that uh, Hales announced his proof in 1998 and it went to standard math journal, which took seven years to referee, which is absurd. And the referee said that they believe the proof to be almost accurate, but they couldn't guarantee it. So that angered the author, right? Usually when a celebrated journal accepts a paper of yours, you are happy, right? Here, the author, was very unhappy because the referee didn't do their job. So the author decided that he would do the verification himself by using computers to verify each step of his proof. So he started this fly spec project, which took until 2014, right? Another <laughs> nine years. And then that proof was checked and refereed and published in 2017. So it's a 20-year project to prove that this is the densest stacking in 3D, but it's now completely verified mechanically. So it's the kind of things I'm, I'm thinking about. So coming back to our main topic, the set of axioms we want to start from can be written in a text file, right? And the statement of the theorem we want to prove can also be written in a text file. The proof of the theorem from the axioms can also be written in a text file. And text file is just a series of zero and ones, right? If you save in a computer. 
So it can be regarded as a gigantic integer. So a text file is just a gigantic integer. So the set of axioms can be written, encoded in a gigantic integer A. The statement of the theorem you want to prove is a gigantic integer T. And the purported proof of the theorem is also a gigantic integer P. And whether P is a valid proof of T from A can be algorithmically determined, right? You just check each step in the proof, whether it's valid or not. It, and it just involves basic arithmetic. Therefore, the consistency of a set of axioms A can be phrased arithmetically, that there is no integer, gigantic integer P, encoding a proof as a text file of zero equals one, right? So the consistency of a set of axioms A is just an arithmetical statement about an integer. So Gadol's second incompleteness theorem in its detailed form says that for any consistent set of axioms A, which is rich enough to describe arithmetic in it, the consistency of A phrased in this arithmetical manner as a question about an integer cannot be proved. And the standard set theory, of course, can describe arithmetic in it. So it's an example of such A. Therefore, Gadel's second incompleteness theorem holds. I don't have any ability to explain the proof in this talk, so please do read the textbooks by yourself. I mean, if you think of, try to think about it yourself, you immediately get confused and get becomes a new crackpot, right? So don't do that. If you're interested, go to your library, get a book and read it. <laughs> so that's right, what I recommend. So uh, sorry. the statement, yes, Why? go ahead. Restricting ourselves to just integers here, like, so, uh, so, so e, 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 here you have uh, encoded this uh, as a, uh, you, here you have written down this different statements in terms of integers, but why are we restricting also to integers here? So like, can it be larger than this class of integers? I mean, it, using integers to encode it is just a convenience. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can use other encoding. Yeah. I see. Yeah. So, so, okay. So, the statement that there is no integer p encoding the proof of zero equals one cannot be proved. Right. So, therefore, there are models in which this statement is true, and there are models in which this statement is false. In the latter case, the statement that there is an integer p encoding the proof of zero equals one is true. This is, con this is intriguing because if the set theory is consistent, how can you, there be an integer p encoding the proof of contradiction, right? Well, what happens is that the set of integer n, quote unquote, in such green models is larger than our own cap n. So there is an integer, quote unquote, in quote unquote n, which encodes the proof of zero equals one there. So it's somewhat like the fact that, I mean, x squared plus one equals zero cannot be, can be solved in C, but not in R, right? So what Gettle's theorem says is that you can extend the set of integers in such a way that it preserves all possible first order properties, but still has, uh, still has a proof, proof, encoding of a proof of contradiction. So that's what's going on anyway. But so isn't this Maybe, model incons inconsistent then? Uh, so this model thinks it is inconsistent, <laughs> but but okay. we, yeah, think it consistent. Yeah, it's, it's tricky. <laughs> so let's consider a program X, which does the following. So it just generates all the integers, 0, 1, 2, 3, dot, 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 right? And regard it as a text file. Most of them are just garbage, but sometimes it reads like a sentence. And sometimes it reads like a proof. And check if it is the description of a proof or a contradiction, right? So if the state, if the standard set theory is inconsistent, then there should be eventually a proof of a contradiction, 0 equals 1, right? So it can be saved in a file which is a gigantic integer. So it's eventually 
uh, we eventually arrive, this program eventually arrive at such gigantic integer, right? Therefore, deciding whether this program X holds in finite time or not is equivalent to proving whether the standard set theory is consistent or not, right? So this is impossible by Gato's incompleteness theorem. So there is a specific program. I have a, I have a question, sorry, uh, can yeah. I? Yes. Interrupt here. So here your, your essential, the, the, the essence, essence of it, the argument actually rests on the finite time issue. So what happens if you have infinite number of processors doing this enumeration ah. at the same time? A quantum computing problem really. I don't really know. Yeah, that, that might change the issue indeed. Yes, we are, so, we are holding, yeah. If you, are, if you allow infinite amount of time, then yeah, it, it might be possible. Yeah, it's actually I, still finite time. Just you have infinite number of weapons processors in, in this case to do your work. Yeah, yeah I, I, don't, I don't really know. Um, yeah, there might be literature on that. So yeah. yeah essentially, you, yeah. So this is really a question of like quantum computing, really. I mean, in quantum computers, there are infinite number of effective processors doing the work. Uh, yeah, but but here here I stick to classical computing because I, okay. I just use, use that. Okay, thanks. Okay, okay. so we we thus it's established the question that uh, this set of questions where xi is a computer program that the property xi is, is whether xi holds in finite time is undecidable in the sense that there is no uniform algorithm deciding whether a given program xi holds in finite time for arbitrarily given xi, right? So that's the holding problem. And I also explained that there's a specific program X such that whether X zero holds in finite time or not is unprovable. So that's the Gödel's theorem. So this part is the holding problem and this is the Gödel's theorem. So are you saying that it can't be proven using uh, classical computers, but can in principle, can possibly be proven by quantum ones? No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> because please because ask the other yeah audience member who raised the issue. <laughs> because because then in it's not it's not a specific it's not a general statement. I mean, in principle, if it can be done, then it doesn't matter whether you can do it by classical computers or not, right? Um, if it's done in principle, then whether it, I mean, why should it matter whether it can be done by classical because, computers? Because, but I, because I'm going to talk about, I'm going to use this statement about classical computers in the discussion of physics. I mean, the discussion themselves are done in mathematics, not done on computers, classical or quanta. It, the discussion here was done just by words, right? It's just a theorem. But the, no, it's a theorem a about class. You made a statement that maybe you're you're using classical computers here and not quantum computers, and in it, in, in that I, case, what you're saying holds. Isn't that correct? Uh, maybe we should leave this for again. I think it's a bit off topic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. T time is running out. <laughs> I mean, it's okay. You you, you can take more time also. Uh, I don't have uh, much but, time. Yeah, yeah. But uh, let, let me let me let me tr try to finish my talk first, and then ask uh, uh, answer questions. L let me do that. The third step is the Diophantine equations, right? So there's a famous set of twenty three problems by Hilbert, who announced them at ICM Paris in nineteen zero zero, and tenth question ask the following, is there an algorithmic method to decide whether a Diophantine equation is solvable or not? So a Diophantine equation is a polynomial equation with many variables with integer coefficients. And you look for answers in integers, right? And this was answered negatively in 1970 by Matthias Evich, following the works of Davis, Putnam and Robinson. So the way they proved it is the following. The point was that, for any program xi, you can uh, find the Diophantine equation P of xi with x1 dot 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 xk such that uh, xi holds in finite time if and only if there is a solution to this equation P of xi, right? 
So as we already discussed that holding problem is uh, algorithmically undecidable, then the solvability of this Diophantine equation is also undecidable because if you can solve, if you can decide whether this equation uh, has solution or not algorithmically, then you can show whether a program xi holds in finite time, right? So it's impossible. So that's so the cleverest part of the proof by Matthias Davis, Putin, and Robinson was to encode or compile a program into a Diophantine equation. Moreover, suppose xi to be the program looking for the proof of contradiction in set theory. Then proving that this corresponding Diophantine equation has no solution is equivalent to proving the consistency of the set theory. Therefore, it is impossible, right? So there is a particular very specific equation, Diophantine equation, whose uh, solvability is equivalent to the consistency of set theory, therefore undecidable. So here is this particular equation. So this is not, <laughs> not particularly uh, uh, horrible. It has lots of variable and it has this huge power B to the power of five to the power 16, 60. So it's huge, but it's a, it, it fits in a page. So you have to choose a particular choice of V and X. So V and X are not, uh, not in determinates, but the parameters. But if you plug in a particular V and X, this equation becomes equivalent to the consistency of the set theory. And therefore, there is, you cannot prove whether this uh, equation has a solution or not. So that's that's an established fact from 50 years ago, 1970. Right? Yeah. Ah, so I already explained this. Okay, so I'm running out of time. So let's skip the quantum materialization, which is kind of fun. <laughs> let's talk about the case where 2D Susie theory uh, is undecidable. So the only new result in my talk today is the question uh, is undecidable. The following question is undecidable. So the set of questions is 2D, 2 comma 2 supersymmetric quantum field series. And the question is uh, whether that given theories has supersymmetric vacua. Again, the strategy is the same, the reduction to the undecidability of the Houghton problem, right? And I use an intermediate step, namely the undecidability of the solvability of Diophantine equations. So I just explained that. So recall Diophantine equation is a multivariable polynomial equation is with integer coefficients, such that unknowns are in also integers. And I said that uh, for any program with xi, there's a Diophantine equation p xi such that it has a solution if and only if the program xi holds in finite time. So let's translate that to a statement in versus amino model. So it's very simple. So uh, we promote variables x1 to xn to chiral superfields capital X1 to xn. We introduce additional superfields, capital Z1, dot dot Zn, and finally a single chiral superfield Y. And we cook up a superpotential W in the following way. So you multiply Y and this equation P xi squared. And then for each subscript A, you consider ZA times sine two pi i xA squared. So this is the superpotential. And you ask whether this has a supersymmetric vacuum or not. So this is the superpotential. So supersymmetric condition is that uh, you take the partial derivative with respect to the variables and impose zero, set, set them to zero. So the derivative with, with respect to ZA imposes sine two pi i XA equals zero. So it imposes the constraint that XA's are in Z, good, right? And then, uh, the derivative with respect to y, the f-term condition with respect to y imposes that p xi is zero. So it imposes the Diophantine equation. And then uh, the final equation is with respect to xa. But uh, you can check that because I chose this to be square, um, this does not impose any further conditions. Therefore, this system has supersymmetric vacua, uh, which happens to be a, a 
parameterized family by Z and Y, if and only if the Diophantine equation peak Xi has an integer solution. So the undecidability of the Diophantine equation just translates to the undecidability of whether this particular Z class of subclass of Zest Zumino models with, with exponential interaction has a Suzy vacuum or not. Right? So there cannot be any algorithm deciding whether a given 2D 2 comma 2 versus amino model has a SUSY vacuum or not. Also, if you take this particular program XI, XI to be uh, the one looking for a proof of a contradiction 0 equals 1, then the corresponding 2D uh, 2 comma 2 theory has SUSY vacuum if and only if the standard set of axioms of math is inconsistent. So you can cook up such a very strange two comma two Suzy theory. Uh, yeah, which has Suzy vacua or not, depending on whether the standard theory, standard set theory is consistent or not. Okay, so I'm coming to the <laughs> conclusion. I just wanted to say that there are cases that for certain choices of theoretical physics questions X and B, uh, it can happen that there is no uniform algorithm deciding whether X uh, a particular X has uh, the property T, P, for all possible choice of X. And also, there is also a specific X0 such that whether X0 has the property P or not is unprovable. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Yuji, for the third provoking talk. So, <laughs> are there any more questions for Yuji? <clears throat> Go ahead, fire away. I want to ask, but, uh, let's say for this, uh, uh, this result seems to be a very general result for any uh, many body system, right? Like if you have some uh, n differential equations or something like that, sorry, or n algebraic equations or something like that, then possibly you can always say that this has this kind of an issue. The a set of equations have this kind of issue, isn't it? Or, uh, uh, yes. Um, so. As long as you can encode a uh, halting problem into your favorite question, uh, you can show that your favorite question is also undecidable. So there are a few papers after this original paper by uh, Contest Metaphysicists uh, showing that uh, various theoretical physics question is actually undecidable. And some of them appeared in nature. So if you want to publish another paper on nature, uh, you can <laughs> try to write one. <laughs> Yeah, I think Ashwin has a raised hand. Uh, hi, Yuji. Uh, I have a question. Hi. Uh, yes. So, uh, I mean, the result you reviewed about Diophantine equations, uh, number theorists would basically take that as a motivation to work uh, seriously on particular Diophantine equations, right? Like you're talking right. about right. way to solve all Diophantine equations, you, you, you know, Fermat Wiles or some other thing. And, and the difficulty varies wildly. So, That's right. uh, it, so is the lesson that uh, the problem of axiomatizing quantum field theory in a way that you're able to answer these kinds of questions is also something like that? Like the difficulty is probably going to be quite varied depending on which particular subclass of QFTs. Yes, I completely you're... agree with you. So of course there are subclass of 2D 2 comma 2 theories for which we can answer whether it has Suzy vacuum or not. Right. right. So we would like to enlarge that subclass as much as possible, but this right. result uh, gives us a theoretical upper bound for that. Right. And Gödel's incomplete theorem itself, or holding problem in itself, also was uh, originally a shock to the respective communities. Mm -hmm. Right. Before Gödel, people thought that any mathematical statement is decidable, but that was not the case. Before the whole thing problem was understood uh, by Turing himself, and people thought that the, you, you could do this, but it is not impossible. So it's just that I, wa I was naive until last year that once physicists as a community <laughs> becomes wise, wise enough, we can answer any questions, but this just says that it's impossible. <laughs> so that, that's what I wanted to say. So couldn't you simulate this QFT on a quantum computer and see if it has a vacuum, a supersymmetric vacuum? Wouldn't that ah. be a kind of algorithm? I don't know. 
<laughs> Great. Uh, so that's a very important point. So unfortunately, I skipped the middle part of the condomat uh, realization. Uh, but uh, so, so in some sense, so let me very, very quickly what this condomat realization does. So it's, its essence is contained in this slide. slide. So what it does is to, so computer, of course, works in a temporal manner, right? So it, it executes steps one by one according to the CPU clock, two gigahertz or something, right? But uh, these physicists uh, cooked up a theoretical model where the computation is done across the temp spatial direction. So the entire computing history is encoded spatially. And such, so that lattice system has the property such that once the execution stops, I mean, the system size is big enough, then such that the entire computing, computation history can be encoded, the energy is uh, positive. While as long as the system size is small so that the computing hasn't finished, then the energy is negative. So, so this is a system with this property and you can uh, make a simple trick to translate this uh, difference in the energy, whether it's zero, uh, smaller or larger than zero into the superconductivity or gap, gaplessness. So, but the essence is that whether the energy is positive or negative can encode the whole thing problem. So what this means is that you can, I mean, at least theoretically, you can imagine a material which can encode your activity of trying to find a contradiction in standard mathematics by trying to just encode long and long, long and long proof of zero equals one, right? So maybe you can one day make a material which is big enough such that the energy is negative. If we can build such a material, then it shows that our set theory axiom is actually inconsistent because um, material says so. But, and, so I, 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 and that's in fact very good because if you can build a material, then that means that you can look for proofs of length approaching Avogadro's number, right? But so far, mathematicians haven't tried a seriously long proof right? <laughs> whose entire length approaches Avogadro's number. So by, by this way, maybe we can experimentally check whether the standard set of axioms for math is uh, consistent or not. So that's one point. Okay. And there are many people with raised hands. Yes, because I think the next one is Subra Balan. Okay. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, it was a very hi. nice talk. I really liked it. Uh, mm -hmm. So my question is uh, about the first statement that there is no universal algorithm which uh, can possibly uh, determine if uh, the pr property holds. But uh, can we have a finite number of algorithms uh, which can do that? And can that be rephrased as a halting problem? Can, can you say that again? Um, uh, so. Can there what be do you mean a by finite, finite number of what do you mean by finite number of algorithms? So there is no universal algorithm which uh, uh, which can uh, which can determine whether p of x holds. But can we ah. uh, can we come up with like uh, a f finite number of algorithms which can possibly tell us if uh, if suppose one uh, does not let us know if p of x holds, can uh, we can ah. probably employ another algorithm and uh, uh, can that be? Uh, phrased as a halting problem? Ah, unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, so it's a, it's a very good point. Thank you for raising it. So, the, so suppose you, can, you have a finite number of algorithms when combined can answer this, right? But then you can write the following combined single program. That program just uses all of your algorithms one by one, right? To test whether uh, X has property P, right? But from your assumption, if you use all of them, you can answer it, right? This means that this single algorithm, which just internally uses a finite number of them can answer it. This means that there is a single, in fact, a single algorithm, uh, which although 
uses multiple number of algorithm as a subroutine, uh, it, it's a single algorithm which can answer. Yeah, yeah so uh, it doesn't matter. Okay, yeah, I understand, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. I, Next I one is Sidat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, um, th thanks, thanks for the talk, it was, it was really nice. I, I had a nice question that um, in the in the halting problem, the uh, the property is is the the system is is a set of finite computer programs, and the property is whether right. they fault in finite time or not. Whereas right. in, uh, even in the condensed matter system, the the system has finite size, I suppose. Um, That's right. But but when we come to quantum field theory, we are looking at systems with infinite size, right? Doesn't that? That's right. Doesn't that pose a, a, a you know? Doesn't that doesn't that how how does how we, how do you, how are you still able to fit it into the uh, paradigm of finite programs? Um, in in some sense, uh, I think we are cheating because uh, two comma two Susie theory is richer, <laughs> as you say, it's infinitely infinite. Yeah, so so it's very, so if you read the quantum math papers. They need to use a very complicated uh, uh, trick to realize what they do. On the other hand, what I did was just to simply translate the Diophantine undecidability into this form, right? So, so your points are related to the difficulty in actually implementing uh, these holding problems. Yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But, but yeah. I'm still confused that you're even able to do it, right? Because uh, somehow the infinite size should have prevented you from putting it into a finite program. I'm, I'm no, sure. not, not really. I mean, uh, in, having infinity in Suzy theory just makes things easier because finite things can be embedded in infinite things. In some sense, I mean, uh, because Suzy theory are infinite, it's, in, it's expected that there are problems you cannot solve because it's, there are infinite number of problems, right? So it, it should be easier. Uh, uh, sure, sure. From that from, from that point of view, yes. But but just to encode it, you know, it's, it's to to make that problem equivalent to the halting problem, where one is working with finite programs. Yeah, yeah, right, right. right? That that is a, a little bit confusing to me that you were able to yeah. do that. Yes, yes, I I, I agree. But <laughs> but yeah, so in, in some sense, I'm cheating. Yes. Okay. Okay. And uh, yes. Uh, uh, right, right. I also, I also wanted to ask. I mean, if if it's uh, if the organizers are okay with it, if you if you have time to um, tell us a little bit more about the condensed matter part, which you skipped, that would be great. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, if, if you have time, yeah, people. I think there are a few questions also in uh, people with hand raised. But sure. if UG has time, of course, after that, okay, yeah, it's, it's not an issue. I mean, okay, let me try. But but maybe we can first go to the questions. Yes. I think the next one is Lucas. Okay, thank you very much. Do you, do you hear me? Yes. Fine, so I have two, two comments. The first mm -hmm. comment is about uh, Gödel's second incompetence theorem. Uh, it's a very interesting fact, historical fact, that Gödel never proved second incompetence theorem. Uh, this proof had been done by Hilbert and Bernays uh, in uh, 1979 in the uh, monograph Grundlagen der Mathematik, Foundations of Mathematics. However, what about uh, Gödel's incompetence theorem? It's very often people say that uh, this theorem uh, says tells that uh, consistency of a uh, Peano arithmetic system cannot be uh, cannot be proved uh, by using only the resources of arithmetic system of Peano arithmetic system. And I would like to recommend a paper. Uh, where a proof of consistency of arithmetic system had been done by using only the resources of this system. And this is the first uh, comment. And the second comment is about uh, quantum uh, computers and so on and so forth. And uh, many people uh, tell uh, about logic, quantum logic and, and so far and so on and so forth. And uh, I would like to point out that classical arithmetic is based on classical logic. Classical logic, first order logic, uh, suffers from a very uh, important problem, so-called uh, problem of entitlement. 
uh, relevance problem or uh, paradoxes of material implication. And here in the uh, next paper is uh, formulated, uh, ha had been formulated so-called atomic logic, uh, which uh, avoids this problem of entitlement. And in the third paper, the last, uh, the last paper uh, to, to which I, the reference I have given now, there is a proof that classical arithmetic can be based on the ground of atomic logic. Uh, atomic logic, so uh, this is the first non-classical logic, which allows to formalize arithmetic system, classical arithmetic system. But this is on the, my, my comment, and thank you very much uh, for, for very interesting talk and for the opportunity of giving uh, these comments. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, uh, so initially you motivated this kind of unpredictability as a third kind of unpredictability in physics, right? But uh, mm -hmm. this, this quantum unpredictability and the chaos and so on, there's, there are quantitative measures to say how much unpredictability you have. So right. is there a similar statement you can uh, bring in in this kind of problems? Say like if you have some additional minimal conditions, how rare, ah. how rare, how rare are the 2D supersymmetry theories where the vacuum can't be decided? And so, to be ah, I see. Thank you. Well, I, I'm not really an expert on this stuff, so I cannot say really. But uh, um, so, one thing I can say is that sometimes by enlarging the set of axioms, you can answer more questions. So, that's a, one basic feature of Gabriel's theorem. So, what happens is that you can add additional axioms to, so that you can answer more questions. But then the fact that you added more questions uh, leads you to a new questions, which is still undecidable in the enlarged set of axioms. So this uh, process continues indefinitely. So that's the only comment I can say. I have a question before you go on to the condensed matter thing. Uh, the vacua of this particular superpotential are defined are, are determined by the equations of motion for the excess, right? That's right. So, uh, what is the exact statement you're making here? Can you please repeat it? Um, uh, I would like to welcome you to uh, just analyze this uh, superpotential uh, by yourself. What happens is that uh, I mean the condition are these three set of equations. And uh, the, once the conditions coming from the first two equations are used, then the last equation does not uh, impose any further condition. So the value of y and z are free. I'm, I'm just saying that. I think Devashi has a question. Also. Yeah. What, what implication does it have for whether the system has vacua or not? I mean, what, what is the connection? I mean, I mean, initially you started off by saying that whether you're investigating whether supersymmetric systems have uh, possibly have vacua, whether that is in undecidable or not. Are the two problems, I mean, are the, are, is that problem related to what you're doing here? I mean, uh, uh, N equals two comma two supersymmetry says that this system has supersymmetric vacua if and only if these solutions, I mean, these equations are solved simultaneously. Okay. So what I'm doing here is exactly to look for supersymmetric vacua. Yeah. Yeah. So, so maybe you should put the next question to Oh, did he, yeah. oh, I, I think he didn't, he stopped raising his hand. Yeah, just, just I had the same uh, question sorry, about this. I, I, sorry, so, oh, may, please may go I ahead. Mean, yeah, please go ahead. Hi. Yeah. yeah, hi, Yuji. Nice talk. Hi, hi. Good to see you. Thank you. Uh, I, I have actually two very simple questions, not uh, very uh, logic in involving complicated logic. Go ahead. Go I just ahead. want to understand your statement that you said that there is a proof verifier which has been developed and uh, can be used to verify whether a mathematical proof is correct or not. Right. Is that is that completely done? Is it, does it exist in its complete form? Uh, there are many 
such proof verifier. So there are active communities around each verifier. So they are, so the core is already de developed, but you need to make them usable, right? So because, uh, you, you mentioned in this context already, and my question is really that. So this potentially removes the possibility of referee and consequent referee bias. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. That's in that's in right. mathematics, at least. Yeah, that's right, yes. Okay, so in, in foreseeable future, there will be no uh, no referees in to check mathematical proofs. Is that correct? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. It might change in 20 years, yes, or maybe 10 years. I've heard okay, the rumor okay. that Microsoft and Google are investing a lot in this business. Okay, <laughs> that's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, and the You're other welcome. question is really, uh, really about the example that you started with. Uh, I'm, uh -huh. I'm a little confused. Did I understand correctly? You said that had uh, some six states and you had a Hamiltonian. Ah, uh, yeah. If I understood correctly, that's a system of uh, you know diagonalizing a finite matrix. So why is that problem? Uh, so complicated and could potentially fall in the un, uh, undecidable category? Ah, because it, 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 it has six states per each site of a spin chain, but the spin chain has hundreds or 20, 200 of sites. So the Hilbert space dimension is, uh, I mean, ah, six okay. to the so power some, n. Okay, so just it's a very large matrix, but. Right, right, right. But, it, but in principle, uh, given any any finite matrix, uh, one can determine the eigenvalues, right? So it's just that's, a hard problem, not, not an undecidable problem, right? That's what I thought. <laughs> that's exactly what I thought. But, but its behavior but in the it? large, large site limit is undecidable. I see. So even linear algebra is not completely uh, it falls in the, some problems in linear algebra falls in the undecidability. Yeah, that's that's right, that's right, yeah. I mean, if you take the large, so, so, so the question of whether the eigenvalues of uh, n by n matrix, a series of n by n matrix where n grows has an accumulating eigenvalue or not is an undecidable question. I see, okay. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. So are there, are there more questions for you to? Uh, can I ask one more question? So um, uh, I just wanted to uh, say, uh, the, you know, a, the, so, you, so you've, you've shown this nice result that there, there does not exist a, a universal algorithm for deciding whether uh, any, any, um, any two comma two theory has a supersymmetric vacuum or not. Right. But uh, if you would like to answer the question of, uh, let's say, uh, um, you know uh, of how what is the set of uh, uh, you know the class of states for class of theories for which we can answer this question uh, and if i would like to as a physicist uh, think that maybe maybe the class of systems for which it is not decidable is not is pathological for some other reason right for some other physics reason let's say so i would yeah, like yeah. to answer if uh, what is this class that for which for which supersymmetric vacuum are, are do exist or not how do I how do I go about doing that? Do I, do <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, so, I don't. Okay, so so maybe maybe I can ask. Can you the the so you had one pathological example. Uh, I suppose one one uh, thing which which is not provable, right? One theory which is not provable. Can we write down the super the super potential explicitly for this theory? Um, um here, I mean, I I already you showed this particular equations. Right, P. So, uh -huh. And let's take this P okay. and plug that here, uh -huh. here. So it's very concrete and it's undecidable. It's a okay. fact of life. <laughs> I see. I see. So, yeah. And so that, so that, that's a particular system then for which for which one can really say that it's okay. That, that's interesting. So that yeah. that polynomial you just showed is like a sum of squares. So so it's right. So is it like uh, each of those each of those uh, uh, terms are 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 of the kind which for which you know because it's like a sum of squares. I would imagine that that uh, each of the each of the pieces are is a Diophantine equation by itself, right? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, it's just a standard trick of combining multiple Diophantine equations into one. Uh -huh. So so it's like combining uh, so with a set. It's like saying uh, a system of finite Diophantine equations is able to encode the. Problem of, yes. 
of a of any any program whether it falls in finite time or not yes it's exactly like uh, uh, the other question by some other participants so if you have a finite number of algorithms which can solve the whole thing problem then you can combine them into a single uh right. algorithm so okay. that geofontaine equation is obtained by combining finite number of geofontaine equations thanks thanks do you know if this Diophantine equation can be realized in string theory? Which which one? Uh, do you know this two kind of two? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I say that sign potential is weird, right? So, but uh, Susie Gage theory can generate uh, exponential interaction, right? So if you read papers by Hori and Vafa proving mirror symmetry, um, you have lots of exponential interaction of exponential of, of X and exponential of Y, but I've never seen exponential multiplied by a single factor, but that might be possible too, by having an instant uh, which requires an insertion of a fermion zero mode. So it's, I, I think it's an actually an interesting question to come up with a more more physics oriented uh, gauge theory whose effective superpotential becomes this. And it, this part is just a polynomial, right? This part is just polynomial. And nobody can call this part weird in a two comma two uh, versus Zemino model. But this part is definitely weird. I, I have a related question. Uh, so if, if even if the set of, even if W xi doesn't satisfy p xi equal to zero, uh, does it necessarily imply that the system has no supersymmetric vacua? Because you can always have a certain potential for which if de del w xi del x a equal to zero gives rise to some vacuum which satisfies supersymmetry, then you're done, right? I mean, you don't need anything else. Because because the excess uh, are the things that determine the supersymmetric vacua, right? Because they are, those not are the fields. No, 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 no. I mean, in this Vestamino model, you need to solve uh, consider all x's and z's and y. So it's a way to encode the Ophanta equations, which only involve small x's, into a supersymmetric theory. Yeah, so true. Here, I, agree. I agree, but I mean, even if if it, what I'm saying is. Your statement is that the super the system has supersymmetric vacua if and only if Diophantine equation P xi has a solution. Is that correct? That's right. That's so, right. So if it doesn't have a solution, but it solves the equation del del W del X equal to zero, uh, and that solution it gives rise to a supersymmetric vacuum, doesn't that negate this statement? I, I sorry, I don't follow your statement. <laughs> My statement uh, is you're saying that the system has supersymmetric vacua only if P xi has a solution, right? Yes. So if P suppose P xi P xi doesn't have a solution, okay. And and then then, uh, then 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 this then this system doesn't have a Susie vacua. Yeah, but it still could have Suzy vacua depending on whether no 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 third, no no third, third no. equation. Satis is satisfied by some Suzy vacua, right? No, no, no. I mean, why not? I mean, uh, the, all, the, all the equations have to be simultaneously satisfied, not just one yeah, is yeah. not enough. No, no, no. Yeah. The statement is that the system has supersymmetric vacua if and only. Yes, he has, he has said many times all three equations should be simultaneously satisfied, not just one. Just P is not enough, that is necessary, but it's not sufficient. <laughs> no, no. The I, He's, he's making the ex that, yeah, go ahead. Excuse me, uh, have you ever studied the SUSY condition of a uh, Vest Zumino model in 4D n equals 1 or 2D 2 comma 2? No. Then you are not understanding the question itself. So I would ask you to uh, study standard textbook on SUSY. Then, then you will see that the condition for this superpotential to have a SUSY vacuum is equivalent to. Uh, P xi have solutions in integers. See, I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about that. 
but uh, you need to learn uh, Susie to understand. Uh, Eta equals zero is just a, is, a, is just a Diophantine equation in enforcing equation, right? It just enforces the Diophantine equation condition, right? It just sets up the potential. Right? Yes, so, 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 uh, I think there are a few more no, raised no, hands. No, Maybe we can. Whether that yeah, yeah. has a solution, it has a supersymmetric uh, solution, supersymmetric vacua as, as a solution, is determined by the third equation, not by the other equation. Though, though the other two equations are just set up the potential such that it in, enforces the Diophantine equations, right? Okay, maybe we can go to Akil. Akil, do you still have a question? You have your hand raised? Uh, no, I just forgot. Thank you. Ah, okay. And I think there's also Lucas. I don't know if he has a uh, Lucas, do you have more questions? Okay, um, I, have a, I have a comment uh, because uh, I'm a physicist. However, I'm a, also a logician. So about the disability. Uh, uh, I ask you very kindly to, to circulate the information uh, given by me on the chat about my papers. Uh, which I have mentioned previously. However, about the dis disability or, or undisability of arithmetic, this is connected to, directly to the dis disability or undisability of first of the uh, functional calculus. And as it is very well known fact, um, according to Church, Alonso Church theorem, uh, uh, first of the uh, functional calculus is undecidable, yes. Uh, uh, in contrary to this uh, result, Leon Gumański in uh, 1983 uh, claimed that uh, he proved the disability of first of the cal uh, functional calculus and he, he even found uh, a mistake, an error in church proof. Uh, and uh, I, I do not, uh, uh, I do not uh, give here uh, any uh, any any uh, answer whether Gumanski's result is correct or not. However, uh, some part of German logicians accepted accepted uh, his his result. So this is uh, this is a very delicate matter. And um, okay, and this is only, only my comment. And say thank you very much. Uh, for the opportunity of, of giving this comment. Thank you, thank you. Uh, okay, okay, thank you. Uh, so, so I think um, Siddharth was suggesting that maybe uh, Yuji could say a little bit about um, the condensed part. So I don't know if, if you have time, Yuji. Uh, yes, or... um, can I have five minutes break? Then I can continue for another 15 minutes or so. Uh, okay, so yes, if... that, that sounds good. What? Yeah. Okay. So and and then sure. So let's let's have five minutes back and then we can just continue for a few minutes. Okay. Thank you. Yep. No problem.
Okay, I'm back. Yeah, yeah. So if you're ready, if you want to speak about the condensed part, yeah, yeah, let me let me just uh, go back to the beginning of the uh, right. Can I ask a quick question, like? Uh, when yes, you, go ahead. When you when you lifted these diaphragm equations to this potentials for the supersymmetric action. Uh, Sorry, I can't hear you. So, uh, so uh, can you hear me now? Hello. Hello. Can you hear me now? I, I'm, I'm very sorry. So, I'm very sorry. Something wrong happened in my computer, so I couldn't hear you, Akio. Uh, what about now? Is it fine? Or uh, yeah, yeah, it, it should be fine now. Sorry about uh, that. Okay, okay. So, like, when you lifted these uh, diaphragm equations to the super super potential, like the fact that in this diaphragm equation these are just numbers, and in the super potential these are like operator fields and so on, that doesn't really bring any subtleties. No, I, I I haven't used any subtle features of n equals two kind of two. I'm just using a very superficial feature of n equals two kind of two, uh, Suzy theorem. So yeah, so it's really not uh, uh, okay. deep deep theorem about uh, or deep properties of two D systems. It's just that the choice of super potential you can have in two D Suzy system is rich enough to encode holding problem or the Fontaine equation very easily. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so for those of you who would like to hear about quantum materialization, uh, here, here is my short summary. Uh, so what the authors did is the following. So, the systems are 2D nearest neighbor quantum spin systems. And the property you'd like to ask is whether X becomes CFD in the continuum limit. And uh, these three authors show that it is undecidable by encoding a computer program into such spin systems such that uh, whether this system becomes CFD is equivalent to whether the computing program holds in finite time. One interesting thing is that the author's name is really cubic. So it's not his pseudonym or anything, but uh, apparently it's his traditional survey, but he does study quantum uh, computing related stuff. So it's interesting. Anyway, uh, so what they did was to first construct a very carefully designed spin system such that the following property holds. So as I said, uh, instead of representing the computation in a temporal manner, they represented the computation in a spatial manner so that the computation steps are encoded as the local states on the, each of the spin sites, right? So it's designed that the Hamiltonian forces uh, the state on the next site is determined by the state on the one site before using the program. So the program just determines the wave function. Uh, of the ground state. So that's the idea. It's very clever. So I recommend you to read it if you're really interested. But the end result is the following. So once the program execution stops, they design the Hamiltonian so that uh, the energy is positive. But as long as this computation is still running, the energy is negative. So that's what it says. So it already at this, at this point, the question of the sign of the energy of the ground state is undecidable. So if you're happy with that, this is already the end of the story. So the really interesting bit uh, is in their paper and I'm not going to review it because it's really complicated, but it's very nice, delicate and beautiful. So what I'm going to say in the next 10 minutes or so is just to translate this property into the gapness or any other, property in condensed matter physics because it's kind of also fun. So let's say this carefully crafted model, artisanal model, acts on a Hilbert space such that local Hilbert space at single site is CN. So you have N states locally, but there are tons of sites, right? Now you choose two of your favorite spin system, HA and HB, uh, acting on 
a local Hilbert space of dimension A and local dimension of dimension B, right? So, and let's normalize the ground state's energy to be zero in each case. So you can pick just Ising model if you want. And uh, you can just choose, tune the parameter so that one is a mass in a massive phase and the other is the massless phase. You now consider a combined spin system such that the local Hilbert space of this form, V tensor A, direct sum with B. So it's kind of strange, but please follow me. And the combined Hamiltonian is the tensor product of this part. Ah, I think this is wrong. Sorry, H gamma times identity and uh, plus identity times H A. So, so it's just that H gamma xi acts here and H A acts here and H B acts there. So it's, it's just the standard way of combining three different spin chains, but with a direct sum instead of tensor product. And you also add penalty term, which I didn't write explicitly, but it just, it is just there to suppress the wave function, which is non-zero on both this side and the other side. So it's just a convenient way of combining two different spin chains in a single chain. So the ground state of the combined system is either the ground state of this side or the other side. So the ground state of this side is just the ground state of HXI and the ground state of HA and, or ground state of HB. So, so the point, the end result is that the ground state of the combined system is either this or that with lower state en ground state energy. But by construction, this part has energy zero and this part also has energy zero, but th this part of the energy depends on the size of the system. So if the size is larger than the stopping time, then the, size, the energy is positive, but uh, energy is negative if the size is smaller than the stopping time. So if you take the infinite size limit, uh, depending on whether the program holds or not, uh, this system, this part of the ground state has energy plus one or minus one. Therefore, the ground state of the combined system is this side when L is smaller than the stopping time, but this side if L is larger than the stopping time. So by this way, you, you translated the, the question of the ground state energy of the uh, sign of the ground state energy of HSI into the property of the ground state of HA or HP. So if HA is a non-massive theory and HP is a CFT, then the combined system is CFT if and only if X XI holds. And if HA is the normal non-superconducting material, and if HP is the non-superconducting theory, then the combined system is superconducting if and only if XI holds. And let's further take XI to be the program looking for a proof of contradiction, right? Then as all, uh, as now, by the logic, by which is, which you are now familiar, um, the combined system, whether the combined system is superconducting or not, uh, uh, is equivalent to whether the standard set theory is inconsistent or not. So that's how you cook up uh, material, at least theoretically, which encodes these undecidability properties. So this might actually be a way to check if the standard axioms on math is consistent, as I already uh, mentioned. So if you can cook up the material, then you can actually look for a proof of length approaching Avogadro number. So you, you might be able to check whether uh, uh, there can be an extremely long proof, which is actually contradicts, it leads to a contradiction in standard set of, of mathematical axioms. Right, so that's, that's all what I prepared for the quantum math side. Thank you. But, but if it's consistent, you will never know it, right? Ah, that's right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but I think there's a still, uh, I mean, this is a real possibility of knowing that the standard set of math axioms are inconsistent. Okay, <laughs> I see. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people believe that it's not inconsistent. I mean, people believe that it's consistent, but uh, so far the length of the proof is finite and not 
too long, right? Yeah. Even the celebrated classification of finite simple group uh, can fit into 10 volumes. <laughs> so it's not too long. So, uh, thanks a lot for this. Uh, um, yeah. are, there, are there more questions? Yeah. Yeah, can, can yeah, I ask a question? Uh, sorry. Th thanks for uh, thanks for giving uh, going through the CFT uh, through, through the condensed matter thing. Uh, mm -hmm. My my question is again um, about the uh, infinite uh, infiniteness in this. So when you took when you took this h psi, you said that uh, you start off with something finite, right? So if you start off with if l is less than l psi, then then your system has positive energy and otherwise it has negative energy. Right. And then you take the infinite uh, size limit. That's right. But in that limit, uh, whether the program halts or not is still a finite time question, right? So we we are so how how is that you know how how is it going into uh, how is it mapping into the, the halting problem? Because ah, the halting problem so, is still about whether the program halts in finite time or not, right? So so you can think of this L xi as the halting time itself, right? Measured in the number of clocks you need to use in your CPU, right? right so right. their Hamiltonian is designed in such a way that the system size is larger than the halting time, the energy suddenly becomes positive. Right. But uh, in a program which goes into infinite loop, that never happens. Right. But now because when L I take the, No, but now when I take the L going to infinity limit, Yes. Then what I'm saying is, uh, this is mapping to uh, whether the uh, program. Uh, I'm, I'm, am I not saying if I'm comparing then the, the back to the halting time? Am I not saying that um, whether the I'm asking if the program halts in infinite time or not? Because now I've taken L going to infinity, right? So then. Yeah. Then, so there you just take L to infinity, but L xi is a fixed constant for a halting problem, xi, but for uh -huh. no halting problem, it's infinite. So, yeah, so, see, so, so if you take the uh, infinite length limit, what happens is that if the program holds, then E0 has a okay. certain sign, but okay. if it doesn't hold, it has a opposite sign. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if it halts, you can say something, but if it doesn't halt, you can say something. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, any more question for you, G? Uh, I know it's getting a bit late. So, yeah. so maybe we should not uh, go, go too long. Okay, so if there's no more question, let's all thank you for the very, very interesting talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much for putting up with a long talk. Yeah, thanks a lot for staying. You must be hungry, right? <laughs> yes, exactly, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for that. No, no problem, okay. Yeah. Thanks all, yeah. I'll, I'll stop the meeting now. Yeah, bye. thank you very much. Bye, bye.